Chapter 11. My Turn, God's Time. Ministry is not done out of a sense of obligation. It is done from a heart of devotion. There was a time in my life in ministry where I saw myself drifting toward the dead place that many preachers and Christian leaders find themselves in at one time or another. Indifference. I saw myself dreading even hearing the phone ring. My phone never stopped ringing, and I felt obligated to answer it every single time. I answered it because when I didn't, people would leave me messages like, I know you're there. The phone just rang. You just don't want to pick up. This would make me feel so guilty, and I'd call back all apologetic, but wanting to say, I'm sorry. I was taking a dump and left my phone on the counter. I'll take it with me the next time. Or even better, I'm sorry. I was sleeping. I tend to need to do that from time to time. But next time, I'll stay up and wait for you to call me so that I can die an early, sleepless death. How about that? You get the idea. As a minister, everyone wants only five minutes. They don't consider what five minutes multiplied by 200 people might actually mean. I'd gotten sick of the rat race. Traveling every other day got tiring, especially when I was single and alone. I can't let girls in the room because God's name and my testimony are on the line. I can't watch the dirty movies because they cost too much. Wait, just kidding. I mean, they do cost a lot, although I wouldn't know since I haven't actually ordered one since like 1998. Wait, did I? Just admit to that? My field life is showing, I suppose. Anyway, there are so many pitfalls awaiting men and women in ministry that I'd gotten to the point that I really thought I was going crazy. I felt like I was going bananas with all of the responsibility that was on my shoulders. God should put up a disclaimer before calling people into full time ministry. I think it should read something like this Help wanted, pay is great, eternal benefits, brokenness is prerequisite, acknowledgement of my son is a must. Must be faithful to the end. Hazardous work conditions. Office space is filled with serpents, scorpions, and legions of devils. Also, there are fake friends to watch out for as well. This job could cost you your life. It will definitely cost you your will. Prayer is a must on and off the job. Fasting is essential. Fighting is encouraged. But the only fight I will ask you to fight according to my employee manual is the fight of faith. Must be a skilled wrestler. Spirits and principalities are waiting to be slammed to the ground and defeated. Once you accept your position, it is for life. Must submit to people who get on your nerves and have limited vision. Must work in team settings with idiots from time to time. Can't punch team members in the face or spit on them no matter how much you might want or need to. Must exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. See Galatians 5, and 23. For promotion, additional requirements must be met. Must be willing to work longer hours for sometimes less pay. Must be willing to lay down your life for the above-mentioned idiot who has now graduated from idiot to full-blown enemy. Must pray for your enemies and love them unconditionally. Please, no fat people. No, of course I don't mean in the natural. I mean no spiritually fat people. Reference Deuteronomy 32.15 in the manual for more information on that. And you cannot apply for promotion. I will elevate you myself upon completion of your necessary field work. You won't see me, ever. If you do, it's because you're dead. Any questions must be directed to me via my son. No exceptions. You are not allowed any off days. Everyone works every day for as long as your lungs contract in and out. If these terms are acceptable, I would love to have you. Sign your life over to me at your closest altar. Or right where you are would be fine, too. Thank you in advance for your commitment. You have chosen the best company that has ever existed. Your benefits are immediate and your opportunity for growth is exponential. I will see you upon completion of all assignments and pay you for any outstanding balance owed to you. I look forward to meeting you at the end of time. We will have forever to catch up. Sincerely, the Most High. Oh, sure, sign me up, I think. I'm fairly certain that the real issue I was having during this frustrating time in my ministry life was that I didn't want to wait my turn. I didn't want to be stuck shaking the hands of 500 people, giving up a thousand minutes of my time. I wanted God to elevate me above what I believed to be the grunt work of ministry. I'm not in the field anymore, I thought. This was fine in the homeless shelter, I reasoned. But I'd already been called and anointed. I was supposed to be doing more. But God said I wasn't ready yet, and I wasn't. I had the gift, but I didn't quite yet have the character that was needed to keep me at the levels God wanted to take me. There was still work to do. Just as David had to wait many years after his anointing in Jesse's house before he could take the throne, I had to wait my turn, and I would soon learn that all the things that I was complaining about then 
were things that wouldn't be a blip on my radar at the next level. How to wait your turn. Shepherd David was tending sheep, fighting lions and bears, learning his craft as a musician, sharing his heart with God, all while he was in the field. When he came out of the field, he was chased and emotionally exhausted by the man he'd grown to call father, but who he'd ultimately replace. There were way too many years of fighting for his life. I'm sure David hated that field at first. It symbolized rejection and isolation. And if you read any of his Psalms of Lament, you'll see that David was also not very fond of his time post-anointing and pre-rule either. That time symbolized misunderstanding and disregard. It represented an overwhelming weight of responsibility with no recognition. It was the place that reminded him of his outsider status. But thankfully, David learned to discern the voice of the living God. He learned about God's time, Kairos. The Kairos moments are the perfect convergence of natural circumstances and spiritual maturity. Kairos time is what allows a number eight to wait their turn. You don't sweat the small stuff, like how many times people call you or how many hands you have to shake. You can relax and give your life and purpose over to God. It doesn't mean you don't set boundaries or that you are sitting around, sleeping in all day, partying all night. It doesn't mean you don't care what happens next or that you aren't seeking opportunities, going to work, preparing for the next thing. You continue doing what you do and trust God for your future. Timothy Keller says in his devotional, Songs of Jesus, Waiting on God, rather than jumping the gun by taking matters into your own hands, is the epitome of wisdom, as the contrasting lives and destinies of Saul, 1 Samuel 13, 8-14, and David, 1 Samuel 26, 10, and 11, make clear. I know it's hard to wait, but there's comfort in knowing that every battle must end. Every king must be replaced. Every leader gives way to another leader. The plan of succession would be so much easier if power wasn't so corruptible. Men hunger for that which doesn't belong to them. People attempt to hold on to positions of power and the accompanying influence as if their lives depend on it. However, number eights have been trained to supernaturally wait on God's timing for anything that looks like elevation. Number eights have learned the hard way that to wait on God is to be maligned and misunderstood by people. But eights are patient. Quietly, intuitively, they know their moment will come. They don't want the position, the platform, or the spotlight until God gives it. Questions for Reflection Number 1. Have you ever not waited patiently on God's timing for your elevation? Be specific. What were the consequences of that? What did you learn from that experience? Number 2. In what ways can a number 8 learn to wait their turn? 